I saw a movie uh, that is a modern classic, and it is a textbook example of a talent grenade, and that is Ang Lee's The Ice Storm. Oh, yeah, that thing's filled with people. Sigourney Weaver, Kevin Klein. I'm going to stop you right there, because okay. I don't want to talk about The Ice Storm. Oh, good. What I want to talk about is the train of history, like that icicle festoon train that Tobey Maguire rides in the movie. Sometimes when the train of history is pulling out of the station, you got to catch it. And if you don't, it goes away forever. Now, I've been hearing about the ice storm for the last 15 years. I haven't seen it. I finally watched it. I was engaged and moved throughout the whole thing, but I still felt like I missed out on something because I didn't see it in the late 90s. Yeah. And I missed the train of history. Back when I was living in the toilet paper museum, my roommate Jeff, he had a copy of it, and I thought I'd sit down and watch it one night. My bad roommate, Brent, you remember him, right? He came in while I was about halfway through the movie, and he points at the screen and says... The ending was also spoiled for me by Mark Maron. Another train of history thing we missed? Key parties. M making out with girls who were wearing Nixon masks. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've been robbed of enjoyment. But it's my fault. I mean, yeah. I've watched seven seasons of Dexter, for God's sake. <laughs> and that's a stupid waste of time. I couldn't have taken some of that time and used it to watch The Ice Storm a little sooner. Let's get on that train. Chugga chugga choo choo! I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to the basement. This episode is our final regular episode of the season. Our final two episodes of the year will be end of the year specials, and I'll get into those a bit later in the show. But for now, we're moving into the holidays, and tis the season. I have a gift for you. Ooh! And it ain't in this box. No, Craig, your gift is tonight's movie. This is a movie that I know you've seen, and I know you love it. We began the year dancing with Saturday Night Fever, and we're going to go out dancing as well. And I hope you're ready to show me your fossy hands, because we're going to be watching all that jazz. Ah, excellent. Yes, I love this movie. I've only seen it once. Whether you like it or not, you will not lose interest in this one. Released in 1979 and directed by Bob Fosse, this film is about Bob Fosse. It's a semi-autobiographical fantasy about the legendary choreographer and dancer and is often compared to Fellini's Eight and a Half. Variety described the film as self-important, egomaniacal, wonderfully choreographed, and often compelling, while film critic Leonard Maltin, old beard face himself, found it to be self-indulgent and largely negative. But he's filming his autobiography. What does self-indulgent mean? He doesn't really like himself, so it's gonna be negative. Tell it to Leonard Maltin, don't tell it to me. I will. Leonard. In 1980, it won the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, and in 2001, it was selected for preservation at the National Film Registry. Good. So it won't rot away. Unlike the dreams and ideals of America in the late 70s. <laughs> Dance on over to the old leather couch for the Bob Fosse biopic, All That Jazz. On the wire is life. The rest is waiting. Joe Gideon is auditioning dancers for his new Broadway show. He's got a stage full of dancers all dancing away. You never see a good jump cut spin <laughs> montage anymore. <laughs> he picks all the girls that he likes. Including Victoria, who he casts because she's pretty and she has nice legs. And because she'll sleep with him. In the audience, we meet his wife and also his daughter, Michelle. He seems to have a very caring relationship with both of them, despite the fact that he's always breaking their hearts. If you want me, I'll be in the cutting room. Cutting myself. <laughs> so I can feel alive. <laughs> At the same time, he's editing his latest film about a stand-up comedian. You suppose Stanley Kubrick ever gets depressed? Stanley Kubrick got depressed when he saw 2010, the year we made contact, which you were in, Roy. <laughs> when Joe gets up in the morning, it's always the same routine. You got the eye drops, Alka-Seltzer, uppers, and then he says, It's showtime, folks. That night, Victoria stops by. What are you gonna do? Sleep with her? Which is what he does. Unfortunately, he gave Katie, his real girlfriend, the key to his apartment, and she sees them in bed together, which upsets her. I just wish you weren't so generous with your cock. That's good. That's great. I need new business cards. 
The reality of Joe's day-to-day -day life is offset by some odd fantasy sequences where he converses with Jessica Lange. You believe in love? I believe in saying I love you. It helps you concentrate. Joe's life spirals between rehearsing, film editing, set design, music composition. We're gonna need a bigger jazz. <laughs> Questionable parenting. What's that? It's a mint. Can I have one? No, come on, you wouldn't like it. If you're going to lie to your child about drugs, don't leave the drugs on the table. <laughs> After telling them it's something tasty. So Joe was burning the candles on both ends, he found other places to stick wicks, and he's just burning that candle all to hell. And his health is starting to suffer. <coughs> Hold it. <coughs> Breathe deep. <coughs> I love those New York novelty doctors that you can hire out. You can't get that here in the Midwest. <laughs> Luckily, he has nicotine and drugs. I think in this movie, Roy Scheider smoked all the cigarettes. <laughs> Rehearsals have begun, and it turns out that yes, Victoria's not that good of a dancer. He yells at her a bit. Stop smiling. Lay back. Lay back. She cries a bit. Maybe I should have quit. Okay, bye. Whew. <laughs> That was easy. <laughs> but he's starting to get disillusioned with the whole thing. Mostly with this number that he's been working on, something having to do with an airline. He doesn't like any of it. After a chat with his ex-wife, Joe has a revelation, and he reworks the entire number. And it's really good, and he brings out the whole Fosse thing, or the Gideon, Gideon thing. Giddy, uh, giddy, giddy, giddy. Adding a sultry, erotic element to it. Introduce yourselves. My name is Sam. My name is Autumn. My name is Jennifer. My name is Rima. My name is Stu. <laughs> I just came in from off the street. Wanted to be involved in your erotic ballet. This makes everyone sweat quite a bit. My name is Rima. My name is Danny. My name is Autumn. My name is Stu. <laughs> I'm still here and I'm having the time of my life! Whatever airline this is, they must have very wide aisles. <laughs> yep. But the suits who are financing the show aren't crazy about it. Interesting. Joe experiences some chest pains and he goes into the hospital where they inform him that he's suffering from acute angina experiences that could possibly lead to a massive coronary. Oh shit, I gotta get back to rehearsals. I'm fine, what do doctors know? So he needs to take time off or he's gonna die. They decide to suspend the show for four months and all the actors are out of work. One of the financiers of the show meets with Lucas Sargent, a possible replacement for Joe. In case Joe dies. Lithgow, played by John Lithgow. It's my John Lithgow. Meanwhile, in the hospital, rather than resting and recuperating, Joe is living it up. His doctors tell him he's not supposed to be doing that, but he does it anyway. He dances around, he hides bottles of booze in the plant, touches the nurses. He's going crazy. Joe's film op His movie comes out, and it looks like it's going to be a big hit, but a very important and untelegenic movie reviewer gives him a bad review, and it kind of breaks his heart, to the point where he has to go into heart surgery, which we see in gory detail. God. Look away if you have squeamish eyes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the doctors! I'm Dr. Hyman, the internist! I'm Dr. Gary, the surgeon! I'm Dr. Ballinger, the cardiologist! And it's me, Stu, again! <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the accountants and the guys who are financing his play make a shocking discovery. You could be the first show on Broadway to make a profit without really opening. Inconceivable! <laughs> Joe has the surgery. And that's when the floor show happens. Hospital hallucination, take one. He experiences a series of hallucinatory dance numbers telling him to clean up his act. Crotch shot. <laughs> now you notice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's me, Stu! <laughs> Joe escapes from his hospital room and he wanders around the hospital. Find him. I want him back in ICU. And right now... He's in I can't see you right now. He encounters an elderly woman, and he tells her that everything's going to be okay, and he gives her a little kiss, and she feels better. I haven't kissed a Broadway director since Flo Zigfield. Thank you. Now, Mr. Gideon, where were we? How'd you know my name? I've got the shining. 
and he finds an old janitor, and him and the janitor sing a song. Pack up your troubles in your own kit bag and smile, smile, smile. I really didn't want this view of your old kit bag, if you know what I mean. And then his heart starts hurting again, and he knows he has to go back into surgery. And then the real show happens. Mr. Joe Gideon. I think I'm gonna die. We see one last big splashy number where Joe says bye bye to his life. know that I can take it anymore. I think my brain has been over fabulous. <laughs> and then he dies. And that's the end. Finito la comedia. <laughs> to be on the wire is life. The rest is waiting. That could have been rewritten as to be on the high wire is life. The rest are waiting. All those other schmucks out there just living their lives while he's out there living a life of adventure and excitement. And if I wasn't up on the high wire, none of you would have anything to do either. My art makes people experience life more vividly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about self-indulgence. Yes. This film was accused of that. Do you think that is an accurate accusation? Yes, I do think it's an accurate accusation, but it does it really well. Up until the last 20 or so minutes of the film, then it becomes too self-indulgent. Yeah, you know, the self-indulgence is all in those musical numbers, yeah. which were all about twice as long as they needed to be. End the number! <laughs> and they all ended two or three times and then started mm -hmm. up again. It <laughs> got a little aggravating. And then at the final number, it was infuriating. Just die already! Yeah. That really was the peak of self-indulgence. It's like, I'm dying, mm -hmm. I'm dying. Oh, to have I mentioned I'm dying? And the weird part about it is that the character really has no hubris. His downfall, the thing that actually kills him, is totally self-engineered. I mean, he knows where he's going. <laughs> he's dying a rascal's death. But excessive. They could have trimmed it. They definitely could have trimmed it. Why was John Lithgow in this movie? Oh, he was brought in as... No, I know why he was in it, but why was he in it? Ultimately, that character didn't need to be there. It's another way of accepting death. If people are going to come behind me. They will carry on in the theater. They will keep it all going. Okay. Nah, yeah. that works. To say that self-indulgence is bad... Stardust Memories, which came out the same year, I believe. It's also very self-indulgent for Woody Allen. Pink Floyd The Wall, not the movie, but the album came out, and that might be the most self-indulgent major and, rock album. And that's all like 78, 79. Directors, choreographers, British rock stars. It was all about looking back at the end of the 70s. <laughs> what is it about the late 70s that led so many people to this kind of self-examination? I have no idea. I, I don't know what Jimmy Carter did to people. <laughs> <laughs> Narrative structure of cheese. What is that? Oh, shows. Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Narrative structure. Yeah, so a lot of the fantasy sequences seem to have that Chicago style of uh, deep dish storytelling. <laughs> By Chicago, I mean the musical Chicago. Yes. Where they talk directly to the audience and they present things in a very presentational way. Yeah, very Brechtian. And did Fosse do a really famous version of... Well, he did the original. Chicago. Oh, he did the original, yeah. okay. Roy Scheider was cast in the lead of this. It seems like a very odd choice, especially considering that he had just done Jaws. And that's such a different role than this. Yeah. He's Ooh, like he's... a guy's oh, guy. Oh, totally, yeah. I wish we still lived in a world where this type of casting choice could be made in a major Hollywood movie. I mean, no one would ever cast a Roy Scheider Scheider type to play Bob Fosse <laughs> in a 2013 All That Jazz. 15 years ago, it'd be like casting Gary Sinise. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> he worked really hard on this movie. I've, I've heard about how hard Scheider worked to appear to be a dancer, but really in the final song and dance number, he doesn't really do any dancing. No, no. And, and that's smart of the director to make that choice. Yeah. You never get the sense that he's not who he says he is. When he's looking at dancers, directing them, the way he moves, mm -hmm. he seems like He's been doing that his whole life, even though we don't see him, you know, step, kick, turn, twirl, uh, whatever. And although we have compared it to other movies, it is unique. This yeah. is the only all that jazz we have out there. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that was all that jazz. If you like the dance in life, check it out. Uh, invite some friends over and have a, a themed party. <laughs> Surrounding it. <laughs> Wear unitards. Friends of Welcome to the Basement always go to welcometothebasementshow.com, the website about Welcome to the Basement, the show. There's a PayPal donation fund that you can also 
donate some of your money for. It goes to support the show. We have expenses like anything. This ain't cheap. No. We've had some good buddies recently donate, and here they are. Hillary, who writes, Watching your show feels like hanging out with two really cool people and an awesome cat. What do you think of that, Ernesto? <laughs> James. Linda. Ariane. James. The supercomputer guy, who made a donation for liver medicine. And Jeff, who writes, Craig, thanks for your deep religious insight on the ghost and Mr. Chicken. You and Matt are the dynamic duo of YouTube. I'm a huge fan. Thank you. And thank all of you. In the past on this show, we've talked about our buddy Rob Matsushita's 10 Minutes About Your Favorite Movie podcast, and I finally was on the show. Finally! I talked about Miller's Crossing. That episode's coming out on December 2nd, and you can get it on iTunes. Or go to littlepodcast.com. And lastly, we have some fan art from our good buddy Chris Pollock, the master of Photoshop. Here is what he did with Valhalla Rising. Look at my abs! <laughs> I know, you look great. You've really done a lot of work this year. And here's the ghost in Mr. Chicken. There's old scared Craig. I know. I haven't been doing work. I'm very scrawny. <laughs> Great job as usual, Chris. And now, it's time for Seen It. Seen It. Tonight we watched a movie that Craig loves. But this episode isn't all about love. No, no. It is also about hate. Last time... We discussed movies that we hate. And we did a Facebook poll for our viewers to find out what movies they hate. And tonight we're going to feature Seen It, Hate It, Part 2. The audience talks back. Bethany Pretty writes, I am legend. After having read the book, I was so looking forward to it until I saw they had cast Will Smith. They turned a fantastic post-apocalyptic morality tale into a mindless summer blockbuster. Seen It, also don't really like it. Seen It. Yeah, me too. They massacred the book. I'm glad Richard Matheson lived to see Hollywood mess up his greatest work three times. Yeah, they did, yeah. didn't they? They totally changed the meaning of I Am Legend. Yeah, they it? finally named it I Am Legend, and they pulled their punch. I thought Will Smith did fine up until a He point. always does fine. Yeah. That should be on his resume. <laughs> I always do fine. <laughs> Rapper? Fine. Actor? Fine. Exactly. Husband? Fine. Tyrell writes, Titanic. Only stayed to the end to see it sink. Seen it. I actually kind of like Titanic. Yeah. I think it's a good, tragic love story. How can you watch Kate Winslet and not fall in love with her? Oh, yeah. Actually, DiCaprio does a really good job in it. That's the one part about it I didn't like. Really? I thought they could have cast a better guy. I like him as an actor, but I just did not like him in that movie. And what our friend said about sticking around to watch the ship sink... Of course. Yeah, that was amazing. And yeah. it's, it still holds up. It's still something to see. A case for a $200 million movie. If they can bring that to life in such vivid detail, yeah. then it's worth it. Also, I'm very annoyed at the cultural ubiquity of the film. For the last 15 years, every time I've heard some dipshit in a bar say, I'm king of the world, I just want to punch him in the face. You should next time. <laughs> see how it feels. You've never punched anyone. <laughs> it's not me. I'm, a, I'm not a fighter. I, I, I know. John Sanford says... Flight, messed up morals, aimless script, offensive characters, and just overall lack of direction. I felt annoyed the whole time watching it and almost walked away at some point. Probably during a scene with John Goodman. Zemeckis is a hack. John Goodman in that movie? He should have won an Oscar for most unrealistic character ever in film. No man could do that many drugs and have that body and be 60 years old. This movie had a lot of problems. It's not a very good movie. But the first 30 minutes are some of the most thrilling minutes you'll spend watching a movie. That is all great, yes. You can just watch the first half hour, you'd probably turn off the movie and you'd be fine. Christopher Bayliss, I'm Still Here, was a huge disappointment and a sad waste of time for everyone involved. Maybe the most complex joke to have never been funny. Seen it. And you're right, jo Joaquin Phoenix attempted to be Andy Kaufman and it fell flatter than Andy Kaufman's wrestling career. <laughs> I bailed on this movie about 30 minutes in because it didn't resemble anything approaching entertainment. <laughs> it's not Borat. It's not Spinal Tap. No, it's a, a douchey movie star's home movies. And Casey Affleck, you ought to have known better. And Joaquin, too. You know, you could have just been content being an Oscar-nominated brilliant <laughs> movie star. But you had to spend a year being a dumb, misanthropic clown and you fell flat on your face and you deserve it. But keep up the good work beyond that. Despite all that, I don't hate I'm Still Here because it's a waste of good hate. <laughs> <laughs> David Denton, I don't like Natural Born Killers. Not because it's a bad movie, it's just disturbing. And the ending to me glorified the bad guys as some sort of rogue heroes fighting the establishment. 
Seen it. Seen it. I really didn't like it when I saw it back in the 90s, and I don't imagine my opinion of it will have improved with age. I remember liking it on the big screen, and then I never wanted to see it again. It is an emotionally vacuous movie. You know what I'd really like to see? Quentin Tarantino remake this movie today using his original vision for it that, and see how that would turn out. Yeah, I put the bad portions of this very much on Oliver Stone's shoulders because it's so easy. Right. <laughs> He's got shoulders you just want to toss bad things on top of. <laughs> that's seen it and that's our show and that's our season. Our next episode is going to be our Christmas episode, and then the episode after that is going to be our end-of-the-year wrap-up. We're going to reflect back on the year. We're going to announce our Hall of Fame inductees, and it's going to be a good time. We're going to celebrate Christmas together. Oh! And we're going to play another game of three-film Monty. Really? And now, for my second gift to you, you are going to pick the three movies that go under the shells, and I'm going to be drawing them. Excellent! The only stipulations are they need to be three movies you've never seen, and the theme is holiday slash family. You can interpret that as loosely as you'd like, within reason. I'm looking forward to that. We're going to do a little more Christmas gambling together as we celebrate the Yule. And we hope that Yule join us next time on Welcome to the Basement. Good night. Good night. You're looking at my nose, aren't you? It goes to the left, see? Do you think I could be a movie star? Not with that nose. <laughs> like a movie star in the movies? Not like a movie star on the subway? You could definitely be a movie star on the subway. <laughs> you could be a movie star in a bakery. <laughs> it's showtime, folks.